Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce. I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm beginning a new series today, and uh, some of you may be familiar with this chart presentation because I've certainly done it throughout the years. I think I began uh, putting this chart presentation together in the late 80s even, but, um, but I still go back to it because I think it's pretty, uh, it, it's really a great tool for people to have. And I, I always wanted the, this chart presentation to be for teachers, for them to use as, as a tool so that they, they might bring forth the message of union with Christ. Now, I've entitled this uh, pr chart presentation, What is Man? And I think that's an interesting question. What is man? And the Bible poses that question several times, I think four times, several times in Psalms and once in Hebrews. So, and I think it's an important question to ask, basically because we Christians born of the Holy Spirit know we know our God, but we don't understand our humanity. We don't understand what man is. We don't, and when I say man, I'm, I'm saying it in a general sense. I'm talking about mankind, men and women. I'm talking about human beings. What is the human being? And I think that's very important um, in my book, The Treasures of Darkness, in the foreword of that book, I write that I love Jesus with all my heart and wanted to serve Him and be for Him, but yet I could not stand myself, my human self. And so I think that's the case for a lot of Christians today. We love Jesus, but we're, we're, we always think of ourselves as being failing and uh, not victorious and not you know, having the power that we, we, we know that, that Christians are meant to have through Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think the answer lies in this question, what is man? What is the human being? Now, you've probably heard me say this many times, that God Almighty is the one and only independent person in the whole universe. And I love to say that. He is independent of all because he's all powerful. He depends on no, no other power. He's self-generating, but he, he, he does, does not generate from anything other than himself. So he is the all wise, all powerful, all uh, uh, self-generating, autonomous, only uh, independent person in the whole universe. And why do I call him person? Well, he is a person. He has created us in his image as persons. But yet you say, well, if he's the only person in the universe, and I say the only independent person in the universe, then what is the human being? And I think that's a, certainly a good question. What is man? Well, that's what we're going to discover in this chart presentation. And that is all important to understand. And um, I'm going to start off by reading the scriptures because, as you can see in this chart, uh, and by the way, if you are interested in having this chart, you can write me, and I'll be sure to send you one. I have, I have it in a small uh, little uh, fold, folding um, package so that you might have your own copy. And, of course, you might want it, so you might write me for it. So uh, the scriptures that I'm going to bring out are in Psalms or in Hebrews because that's where God poses the question. And he says in verse 4 of Psalms 8, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou did visiteth him? Thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim, and hast crowned him with honor and glory, and hast made him to have dominion over the works of his hands, and thou didst put all things under his feet. Wow, that's pretty, pretty big, pretty big presentation of what man is. So, and I, and I dare say this is unfallen man that he's declaring is, was originally created a little lower than God himself and actually higher than the angels. A lot of the translation, translations say, and I think the King James does say that he was made a little lower than angels. But I understand that from the theologians that that's a mistranslation and it's a weaker translation because actually the New American Standard and 
the new the amplified version say that man was made a little lower than god and actually in his original creation he was made higher than the angels even wow that's wonderful now but we also know that through the fall he was made lower than the angels because because you see angels are immortal beings and and we're mortal flesh we became mortal flesh through the through the fall subject to death of course subject to sin and death that's what the fall is about so in hebrews chapter 2 when the author of the hebrews letter is bringing out that christ is greater than the angels and christ but christ was also man I love uh, this whole chapter because it certainly brings out that Christ was made. And it says this. It, sa it poses the question again. It brings the question from Psalms 8 again. And it says, um, And unto the angels hath he put, not put in subjection the world to come, wherefore we speak. And so the angels will be subjected to the world to come, the, the new world to come. But but one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou did visiteth him? Thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim, and hast crowned him with honor and glory, and did set him over the works of his hands. Thou hast put all things under subjection under him. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But we... Now, but now we see not all things yet put under him. Why? Because we have fallen. And through, but through the redemption of Christ, Christ, uh, uh, our, the second Adam, became man so that he could raise us up into uh, the royal place that we were first created to be, a little lower than angels. And actually he has put us into uh, Christ himself because the second person of the Trinity, that's a pretty high and royal place. Now, why can't we see that we, the redeemed man really has this dominion over the earth and over all things on the earth? Because man has fallen, you see, and through his fall, we have been inundated with satanic lies about the human being. And, uh, and through the fall, Satan has made us think that we're sufficient, we're able, able. And we're, uh, we're independent from God, able to do our own thing, which is a lie. So the answer to what is man is exactly the Bible answers that. And the Bible answers that in uh, the eighth uh, chart that I'm going to bring out. And I'm going, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to the eighth chart because I think it's important to bring out what the Bible says that man is. Okay, the Bible says, and this is how he defines man, the Bible does. Okay, God defines man as a derivative being. He derives his nature, he derives himself, he derives his energy, he derives his nature from the life of another. He, never, he, he is not an independent being having his own nature. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible is saying. And the human being has no independent sor life source of his own. He does not. And that's what we don't understand. And that's what's really been lost through the fall, our understanding of what is man. That's why it's so important to bring out. It's so important to make that clear from the beginning, what the Bible says that man is. Think about all of the symbols that God says the, bio uh, the human being is. The human being is called a vessel. Well, we know that. In um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that we're earthen vessels, that the excellency not be of us, but be of God, and the power might be of God and not of us. So the Bible calls the human being a vessel or a container. It does not say that we're the God in the container. If, if I had a cup, uh, you see, I'm the one, the cup is the one that contains the God. Uh, but is not the content of the cup. So the content is one thing, and the container or the vessel is another. So the human being, the Bible calls a vessel. It also says in Romans chapter 9 that the human being um, is either a vessel of mercy, because if we've received the Lord Jesus Christ, we're a container or a vessel or an earthen vessel, it says. 
that, but we can, we've contained Mr. Mercy himself, Jesus. So um, we've, we've, we're containing his mercy. So it says we're a vessel of mercy. Okay, but it also says people that are not saved are a vessel of wrath. So, but the vessel hadn't changed, but what's in the content of the vessel has changed, or the cup, or the container. What's inside of it has changed, but what the cup is has not changed. So we're always a vessel of one or the other, of either of God's mercy or God's wrath. And the Bible says, and I love this, it's in uh, John chapter 15. Jesus brings this out. Jesus says a wonderful thing in John 15. He's talking about the human being being a branch. It's like he likens it to a, a tree or a vine and the branch. And he said, now you humans are a branch. You're not the vine. You don't, you're not your own life source because we know that the life of the vine or the tree is always in the sap. It's not in the branch itself. The branch itself can produce nothing in and of itself. And actually, that's what Jesus says of us human beings in John 15 when he says, without me, you can do nothing. So you see, the power does not come from the human being. It comes from the vine. It comes from Jesus who is who lives within the vessel, who lives within us. If you, if you are a born again person, the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus Christ in you is your is is the truth about you. But the human being is only the vessel that contains the God, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the third person, and really the Father. Because uh, the Bible says in Colossians that the Godhead dwells in Jesus holy bodily, and also the Godhead dwells in us holy and bodily. Wow. So, but you see, we never become what's inside the content. That's our problem. We've confused uh, the role of the human being. We think the human being is the producer of uh, and, and the life source of its own self. See, that's what Satan really uh, uh, taught us through the fall. Because through the fall, really, we were stolen away by him. And we have received his mentality, a knowledge of good and evil, a knowledge of, of an independent self being good one day and maybe doing a few bad things, but hiding that. And basically, I see myself before I'm saved as producing my own good and maybe some bad, but I'm doing it myself, you see. So what we have really lost through the fall is the mentality that the human being has never, ever, ever been an independent being. We've always been dependent on the life or the death, really, when we received uh, 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 the satanic spirit within through the fall. You see, we're depending now on that satanic self-centered spirit that lives in us. And we're going to prove that through the scriptures, because how can I say these things? These things are probably shocking to you. Maybe you've not even heard this in your Christian circles, but, but it's so very clear in Paul's teachings. And I think so, many, so much of our teaching today, uh, Paul's teaching is left out. And basically, this is the basic uh, uh, gospel that we should all know and understand, that we were... Uh, a vessel containing wrath, and through the cross, now if you've received Jesus, you're a vessel of mercy, but you've never been an independent vessel of yourself. The Bible calls you a branch. Without the power source within, without Christ within, the branch can produce nothing. But we always act like that we're a branch that is uh, broken away from the vine, basically, because we see ourselves here on earth and we see Christ in heaven and we see ourselves separate from uh, Christ. Now, basically, what Jesus is saying in John 15 is you're in union with me. I will, because that's what he was telling his disciples. He says, I'm going to go away. And if I go away, I'm going to send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will dwell in you and I will be in you and the father will be in you. That's John 14, 20. And so he's, he's, he taught, he started talking to them about union in the very beginning. So I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be your power source. I'm going to be your life source. I'm going to be your all and in all, but you have to trust me. 
You have to believe that I live in you. You have to believe what the gospel is saying. That once you've received me, you've received my life source. You've received my power. You've received me. And so, um, uh, but, but you've got to understand the vessel can never produce its own righteousness. And that's what's hard for us to understand. Basically, because we've been inundated with so many satanic lies of separation and independent self. That's why I major on that, because there's so many lies about in, uh, believing that man can produce his own goodness, can produce his own fruit, can be the content in the vessel. So the Bible clearly says that you're, you, the human being, are the vessel. You, the human being, are the temple. It also calls us slaves, and that's in, John, in, in uh, Romans chapter 6. It says, you were a slave to sin, and now through the cross, you are a slave to righteousness. But you see, the human being doesn't change. You've always been enslaved to either one spirit or the other. And I think that's so foreign to most Christians. They think, what? I've never heard this. I want you to read. Go to your Bible, and I want you to read Romans chapter 6, and you'll see exactly what I'm saying, that the Bible says that you were a slave to sin. In other words, you weren't just arbitrarily doing your own sin apart from a spirit that was living within you, producing the sins through you. You were a slave to Mr. Sin himself. And now through the cross, you're really a slave to righteousness. One time I had a woman call me. I didn't know her. And she said, somebody told me to call you. Maybe you can help me. She said, I've been a Christian for some time. But I was in a Christian fellowship that demanded that, uh, that I was outwardly perfect in every way because they were demand they were putting so many laws on me. I decided I couldn't even be a Christian because I couldn't perform all this. And she said, so I decided I'm not going to be a Christian anymore because this is crazy. I can't do this. And so she said, and so she said, so I tried not to be a Christian. And she said, but you know what? I couldn't not be a Christian. And I said, of course you couldn't, Nancy, because once you've received Christ, you're a slave to righteousness. You're a slave to Mr. Righteousness himself. And he's got, he's got a hold on you. And the truth is the human being is not meant to ever produce its own righteousness. We're only the container of Mr. Righteousness that produces the righteousness through us and by us and as us, as if it's me, but it's really him and his righteousness that he produces through me. So, so much law is put on the human being, the human vessel. I mean, the branch is told, produce fruits. The vessel is told, be your own content. You see, the temple and, and the Bible also calls us temples. We're not the God in the temple. We're only the house that holds the temple. We're called the church. Well, the, the church is not a building. The church is the body. The temple is your body. The temple it holds the Holy Spirit. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. The wisdom comes from the Christ within. So we've got to get in touch with who lives within us and how to know that we're in union with Him, and He is our life source. He is our power source. He is our righteousness. He is our peace, you see. So the confusion comes because we don't understand the human being. The Bible calls us bodies. Well, we're the body, and He's the head. I mean, I think Paul brings that out clearly in the Colossians letter. He says, uh, he says we're only the body. And we know, I mean, a human body can't do anything apart from the head. If we cut, our, cut my head off, I'm certainly going to be dead. So all of the wisdom comes from my head. All of the impulses uh, and electrical impulses that surge through my body that makes my hands move, my feet, my mouth, it all comes from my brain, my head. And so Christ is the head of the body. The body can do nothing apart from the head. The head can do nothing apart from the body, and Ephesians says that. That's a very interesting thing. It says the fullness of Christ is his own body. Wow, because a body can't, can't, a head can't be apart from the body, and the body can't be apart from the head. So you see, the, the whole truth of what man is and how in our first original creation, before we fell, we were created to have dominion, over the whole earth, we were to have dominion over Satan, over all the satanic works, and we were higher than any angelic being. And uh, But through the fall, we fell lower than the angels, 
And that's why Jesus had to become in human flesh. And that's in Hebrews chapter 2. I love it. It says, And now we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. He had to be because for the suffering of death. Why? Because he had to take on mortal flesh. Because God can't die. Crowned with glory and honor. And by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. For it became him of whom are all things and by whom are all things to bring many sons to glory and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So Jesus himself was made puff perfect through the things that he suffered or complete. And he learned obedience and, uh, by the things that he suffered. So that's another thing that we're, we're going to talk about in this presentation. What is man? For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified, meaning, meaning the believers, we're sanctified basically because of the gospel, because of the blood and body, death of Christ on the cross. We are not just justified, but we are also sanctified by his body. Our, we are all one with the sanctifier, who is Jesus himself. For which cause he is not ashamed to call, to call us his brothers. I love that. Saying, I will declare thy name to my brethren. In that isn't that wonderful that Jesus calls us his brothers, that we can call him our brother. My goodness, a son of God, the second person of the Trinity, and we're calling him our brother. My, what an intimate relationship we have with God. In the midst of the church, I will sing praises unto thee. Wow. And again, I put my trust in him, in Jesus. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, and that's what we were, partakers of fallen flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This is the gospel, folks, right here. He came to destroy the power of the devil that reigned inside of the human vessel and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the whole... Gospel is about deliverance, delivering us, the vessel, the branch, the vessel, the temple, the slave, the wife, the body. That's the human being. That's what the human being is. So uh, that's how I'm going to start my presentation on what is man. Uh, and I started, and like I said, if you are able to get this uh, chart presentation from the Liberating Secret or Spirit Broadcasting, I'll be glad to send that in the bookstore on the Liberating Secret. You'll be, you'll be glad to send off and get this presentation for yourself. It will be very helpful to you. And I don't know how long it's going to take me to go through this, but I am going to do it. Well, I'd like to read to you what I have on the back of my little presentation, and it says this. What is man? Take a wild journey into the wilderness of Arabia, and like the Apostle Paul, you will suffer the loss of all things. Yet you will also discover your glorious union with Christ. As long as you think you, have a, you are separate from Christ, then you will act, think, and live a defeated life. However, if you dare to go with the Holy Spirit to the depths as well as the heights of real true self-discovery, then you experience freedom like you have never experienced before. And I can test to that because I have lived in the liberating secret for almost 40 years now. It's a living reality. It's not just words. It's not just scripture. It's not just doctrine. It's a living reality that has set me free and has anointed me to preach this gospel and this truth to the body of Christ to also so that you might be set free by, by the Holy Spirit. So, and let me read to you the very first page of this um, chart presentation, and it's right here. But here it is. It says, Discovering What You Already Have in Christ. And this was written by Major W. Ian Thomas. And he was uh, English, I believe. So some of you may have read uh, Saving Knowledge of, of Jesus Christ by Ian Thomas. If you are a Christian, I have no blessing to offer you because you already have all of them in Jesus Christ. Wow, that seems so foreign from what most of us think. Oh my gosh, Jesus, give me more blessing. Give me, give me, give me. 
See, that's how we think, because we're not understanding our humanity. We're not understanding that we already have that fullness in Christ inside of us right now, if you're a Christian. All you have to do is begin to discover the blessings in Christ, in Him, that you already have, but have not yet possessed an experience. That's the point. The children of Israel had the promised land, but they would not possess it. The Christians today do not have to live in the desert of striving and trying. They already have the promised Sabbath rest, uh, the promised land of the rest that God promises the people of God. We already have that in, in spirit, but we can live as long as we want to in the striving and failing and trying of, oh, wretched me, what's wrong with me, if you want to, but it's available. All you have to do is possess your possession. Now, this is what he says. The moment you are redeemed and the moment the Lord Jesus Christ is come to indwell your redeemed humanity, God has given you the plenitude of heaven. You will never be wealthier than the day you were redeemed. But you can live in self-imposed poverty the rest of your life if you want to. The children of Israel stayed in the, in the wilderness 40 years. They didn't have to but they would not possess their possessions. They would not take their leap of faith and trust God. They thought their circumstances and their giants were greater than what God says. And the fact that God was with them, you see, they wouldn't go enter it. You can stay in that trying and failing in Romans 7 mentality the rest of your life if you want to. Or, but what we want to do is to discover how to explore and enjoy all that God has already given you if you are saved. He's already given it to you. But it will be the devil's business to prevent it. My goodness. Now, why did why that, why that little P.S.? Because there will be great opposition, just like the children of Israel, the giants were there facing the children of Israel. And uh, the opposition always has to be there. The counterattack always has to be there. The satanic counterattack of appearances, of what things feel like, of what things look like, because God is going to require to you to go past what you feel and what you think and what circumstances look like. And the fact that you might look like grasshoppers, because that's exactly what the children of Israel thought themselves to be. But yet this new land of rest, this uh, Sabbath rest that God has promised to every redeemed person is yours. And I can attest to it as a living reality. I've lived in that for almost 40 years now. I, I'm, I'm so thankful to say that. And I'm here to testify that as a living reality, not just a doctrine, not just a lot of uh, good words, but a true living reality that we can live in and move in and know the rest that's given to us in Christ. So thank you for joining me, and we're going to continue this next time on The Liberating Secret. Goodbye.